So welcome, Melina. Um, Melina is a they, them, a queer, gender fluid, white settler who began meditating 20 years ago in both the Insight and Plum Village traditions, including nine years as a monastic ordained by Thich Nhat Hanh. Melina returned to lay life in 2021 and is now a psychotherapist and a meditation teacher with an orientation towards embodiment, compassion, social justice, and creativity. And I re-met Melina when we were in six weeks of silence. So that was uh, a nice way to meet. We didn't even talk. So we just sat in the queer affinity sit. So I will uh, remove myself from the spotlight and hand it over to you, Melina. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Is the sound okay? Yeah, okay. My internet's been funny today, so please let me know if anything goes wonky. Um, so yeah, I'm super honored to be here. Um, I just want to ground in. The land that I'm on and the land that we are all living upon that is giving us life, that is sustaining us, that has sustained humans and other all life forms for billions of years. And in gratitude to the traditional stewards of the land and also holding the complexity of ongoing violence and historical violence. Honoring the spiritual Buddhist and other lineages that have informed all of our practices, the wisdom received and transmitted all the care and also sometimes the harm and complexity that's also been transmitted. I wanted to thank the air spirits and the fire spirit and the land spirits and the water spirits and all the unseen forces that are also part of this evening and this practice and this time. May there be moments of, of support for whatever is needed. And may whatever is touched in this practice help us to get a little more insight into how to show up and serve and be in right relations with one another. And so this topic of exhaustion, practicing with exhaustion, um, both hits the, like the very personal, the the day by day, like I know didn't sleep well last night. So that's, that's how it's you know like showing up in the front of the mind, but it's also a symptom of this society and late stage capitalism and colonialism and all these structures that like push us to exhaustion. Um, some folks a lot more than others. So just recognizing that like we're going to be tapping into this subject in a lot of different ways, and it's all really welcome. I'd like to share maybe about ten minutes of some sort of framing this, and then go into some practice. And then share again and then open a conversation. Um, and especially because this is on the theme of exhaustion, like please be really uh, permissionful, <laughs> honest, and uh, and deep listening uh, and is invited to like let your body be still or move, lie down, walk whatever is actually supportive um, is really welcome. So I, I was both moved by this topic because it's just how I've been feeling as well as it's been such a both challenge and then a zone of freedom to practice really actively with exhaustion. And even though, um, you know, I'd heard talks about practicing with the hindrances and um and that you can you know that sloth and torpor is just a hindrance and you know it's it's one of the things that happens in practice not a big deal I think it was a good 15 years before I like 
really, or maybe a good 10 years, like, oh, wait a minute. I really saw how my mind just held. Oh, but if I'm tired, if I'm wiped out, like I can't practice, you know, like there's nothing there to practice with. Um, and the first time I had a, a big opening came when I lived in Plum Village in the monastery there, which was not always restful. Um, we would run retreats for like a thousand people in the summer. And so I often was the driver for the grocery shoppers because I could drive. So that meant like big cube van driving around for like eight hours, helping with the grocery shopping. And I was just like wrecked. And I remember being in the equivalent of like a Walmart or some sort of big grocery store in France. And I was like, I can't, I can't even take another step. I'm thinking about like going back to rest in the van, but I was the only one of the team who spoke French. So if I wasn't there, then there could be no questions. <laughs> right. So there's, there's a, there's a bit of need. And I remember this one sister um, who had said that she had learned to rest while she was doing anything while she was cooking, while she was, uh, and, and I, when I heard it, I was like, right. <laughs> but I was kind of desperate. You know, like my legs are kind of trembling. I was like, I have like hours more. I need to, I need to drive safely. You know, it's not just like my own set. There's a sense of pressure of like, how am I going to get through this day? Um, and something in that desperation was like, what if I took her advice seriously and experimented with like, can I rest while I'm grocery shopping? And so I remember so clearly like my hands were on the grocery cart. And I just decided, what if I would just walk through the store as restfully as possible? And all the stories of like, I can't do this. I'm going to collapse. This sucks, whatever. Like I, my body hurts. Like, okay, what if I just let them, you know, move to the side and I really stay attentive to relaxing and releasing as much as I can, as I keep pushing the grocery store cart through the store. And it turned out to be this like amazing day. Uh, it was still challenging. I still needed a lot more rest, but it was my first inkling of, oh my gosh, all these stories in my mind of like, I can't be present with this. This is too much. This is too hard. Weren't actually true. Um, and then in the years since I've just, I've had all, all these different permutations of more and more layers of, oh, I thought I had really <laughs> like, you know, faced the exhaustion and transformed it. Nope. Here's another layer of my brain saying, oh, but this is too much. And not just with exhaustion, but with everything, right? There's like all these different layers of like, this is too much to be with. And usually out of desperation came moments of I've tried to push every, this away every way that I know possible. <laughs> it's not working. I've tried to like Dharma myself out of it. What if I just like focus on something else, right? But the actual being willing to be with what feels unbearable has continually been this doorway into transformation, into liberation. Um, and I remember a good friend, her own version of this, she had um, a, a baby, it's probably about a year at the time and she was a single parent and you know like it had so many months of not sleeping and was so beside herself and I've been a practitioner already for quite a long time and so she told me this story once of you know it was like three o'clock in the morning and she was losing felt like her her words felt like I was losing my mind um really losing her sense of sanity I I think it's fair to say. And something again in that sort of um, sort of being pushed to surrender <laughs> to the unavoidability of the pain of it, of the difficulty of it. Well, I can't necessarily get more sleep, but I can get really curious about what exhaustion feels like. I can get to know this, this wiped outness really, really well. And she just took it upon herself to like get really curious. And then to think of every other parent who's not sleeping and kind of hold them with her and 
And it really transformed her experience of parenting and became a turning point in especially that, that young, young, uh, the early stages of, of parenthood. And so this like, can always, it's unfortunately often really hard, <laughs> these moments that push us to being willing to face what felt unfaceable, to experience what felt unexperienceable. Um, and yet it's this doorway to opening. And so um, this isn't just true in formal meditation and inside our bodies, but it's true in our relationships, it's true in the world, it's true in, the, in so many ways. So I want to give us a chance to practice with this being willing to meet what feels untenable, which might be exhaustion or tiredness or pain. Um, but just to say a little bit more about that, that so often the mind has this idea, especially that's been conditioned through the societies that were raised in through colonialism and capitalism and patriarchy and um, all these systems of domination that teach us to push through, numb out, ignore what we're actually feeling. And so these invitations in the Dharma to stay with, to get curious, to be present. I know for myself, it was just, you know, a good 10, 12 years of assuming that that meant like try harder to be with tighter and more focused and again the transformation came from realizing that actually staying with is a question of how much more gently can I stay with <laughs> how little effort can I use to just stay alert enough to not be spacing out how much energy how little energy can be used to kind of enjoy <laughs> or at least like find a little bit it of uh, something in the, in the root of ease. Uh, and so there's this poem that some of you have probably heard in the book, The First Free Women, translations of the Terigata, the poems of the first awakened nuns called Genta the Conqueror. So I'll read this poem and then guide us into some practice and then share a little bit more and open it up. I was forever getting lost until one day the Buddha told me to walk this path, you will need seven friends. Mindfulness, curiosity, courage, joy, calm, stillness, and perspective. For many years, these friends and I have traveled together, sometimes wandering in circles, sometimes taking the long way around. There were days when I thought I couldn't go on. There were days when I thought I was finally beaten. It's scary to give all of yourself to just one thing. What if you don't make it? Oh, my heart. You don't have to go it alone. Train yourself to train just a little more gently. So for the next little bit, can we train ourselves to train a little more gently? And that may be with difficulties in the body. It may also be the exhaustion of going violence to ourselves and our trans and queer communities and the ongoing genocide in the world, especially in Gaza, but in many places, the ongoing climate crisis, whatever we are so tired by. Can we train ourselves to train just a little more gently and see what's possible? I'm going to invite the bell three times. And if you want to adjust your posture at all, I have about 20 minutes. I'll guide the first 10 minutes and then we'll have silence for about 10 minutes. Eyes open, closed, screen on or off, lying, standing, sitting, walking is all very welcome.
So tuning into the ground beneath the surface that is supporting the body and the contact with that surface. Maybe noticing the pressure, the temperature. Can we see if it's possible to hold ourselves up just a little less and let the ground hold us a little more. We may be so used to bracing ourselves to get through whatever we're getting through that the muscles don't even remember. Don't even remember how to release. And that's okay too, that's welcome. We just explore. Is it possible to give our weight a little bit more into the surface that's holding us? Knowing that that surface is held by the earth. always held by the earth. And then also tuning into maybe the spine or the skeleton and the sense of whatever's holding us up. And seeing if there's a little more room to allow for length or spaciousness or openness in this body that's both resting and yet there's some aliveness, some uprightness or length. Especially there's a little bit of space, even just a tiny corner, that's a little bit of space. Not make room for just a little bit more curiosity of oh, how is it right now inside this, this bag of flesh and bones and muscles and blood and this body. There's a lot of sensations we just Notice the brush, broad strokes. If there's almost nothing, then we don't need to force it. Just noticing, oh, not much sensation right now. We might rest into the sensations of breathing if that's a an anchor that we're used to working with. Resting, upright, curious, breathing, or maybe tuning into the sounds coming and going, or the general flow of sensations moving arising and passing in the body. And at some point, you may notice physical tiredness just from it being later in the day. You may notice some discomfort that we're tired of being with. There may be tenderness in the heart and tiredness of living through of 
surviving the brutality of the world and witnessing the harm being done to our kin and neighbors. And in these spaces, can we both find rest in what is stable, maybe the ground or the breath? And then see, can we be a little more gentle, train a little more gently, maybe sit next to the pain. You don't have to be right inside it, but, but how close can we get so we can stay at least a little bit? Sometimes just softening the muscles of the forehead. And the jaw and the hands offers that softness to train a little more gently. If we've been a little on the strident fight flight side of things, and if we've been in a bit more of the freeze collapse side of things, then can we just wake up the slightest bit more interest Curiosity, maybe even playfulness. Oh, what, what's it? What's it really like in this boring or uncomfortable <laughs> or difficult moment? If things aren't feeling tiresome or difficult, then can there be some savoring? Wow, this is a moment of non-dukkha. This is worth noticing and also getting curious about staying with in a gentle, spacious way. So we just keep checking in. Oh, do you need a little bit more energy or a little less effort? A little more wakefulness, a little more relaxation. And if we happen to fall asleep, no big deal. Maybe we needed it. So we'll continue in silence for about 10 minutes. Partway through, I will just drop in a few words and otherwise play with this energy. See if you can find maybe a renewed sense of this balance that comes through moving away and then coming back and moving away differently, coming back. Oh, a little too much. Okay. Oh, a lot too little. Okay.
train yourself to train just a little more gently. Curious and restful. Receptive and alert.
just a few more breaths in this formal practice. Seeing if there's another recalibration of energy that will be helpful. Just a little more, just a little less. Enjoy a sweet spot. And practicing with any hindrance. There are lists of all these antidotes, but the common denominator is compassion. You can always apply compassion to whatever feels hard, whatever feels like it's in the way. So maybe a few breaths of compassion directed inward and all around. You want to stay in more of a contemplative space, still having your eyes closed or screens off, you're really welcome. And it's also lovely seeing folks on screen who are able and who enjoy that. Um, I'll continue with sort of a development, both the exhaustion and then bring in the emptiness that was also in the title, in case you noticed that. So, so this balancing not too much, not too little, or then, you know, noticing when we're off balance and then gaining more and more capacity to notice <laughs> and more and more capacities to return to something like, whether we call it balance or just to be in a space of capacity as opposed to not being in a space of capacity. Um, I guess that happens on the question happens in the way we engage in our relationships. You know, there's like, how can we stay with, I was remembering a friend who would have a horrible experience um, with a pretty emotionally abusive parent who, you know, I mean, she hadn't lived with them for quite a long time, but um, needed to cut off contact for a good year or two. And yet just really committed to the practice. And it's like, I don't want to, I don't want to cut someone off, but I really need this. And and in conversations like, well, how much can you stay present with and still have capacity? <laughs> when I was a monastic and so I was living in the monastery with us for a little bit. Um, and I think at one point she was like, well, I could check with my heart like every six months and just see, do I have capacity to reach out right now? Yes or no? It's like, yeah, that's staying with. Right? It may not be the model that some people put forth, but it's actually incredibly vast, the, the possibilities of what staying with can mean. And I bring that in because I think often, especially if you've been on retreats or depending upon what kind of traditions you've encountered the Dharma through, there can be what sounds like, like you just have to like stay with things all the time. Even if you feel tired, just keep practicing, don't rest. <laughs> I haven't found that to be helpful. I've, I've found that to be damaging. Um, but when it comes from the gentleness of like, oh, how much more gentle can you be to stay with? Which also includes sometimes, of course, we need to sleep. Um, I did end up doing a retreat once. I didn't know that it had three days of not sleeping, what they call tiger practice. 
Um, and I didn't, I, you know, I could have just not done it, but I had always been curious. I thought it sounded incredibly difficult and kind of dangerous. Um, but I was also curious because I'm just into meditation like that. <laughs> and so I was like, well, I'm here. I'll try it. And it was such a phenomenal lesson in, because it was like equal parts, sitting, walking, sitting, walking practice. And I was like, I really can't take one more step. Okay. That's what my brain's saying. Let me get really curious. Do I actually have capacity? And, and, and I did, I, I think I probably fell asleep for like half an hour on two of the three nights and otherwise just found this different staying with more gently. And I don't encourage anyone to do this unless you're really, really excited by it. <laughs> but, you know, there's just like so many different ways of, of just getting more and more present with how is it actually right now? Um, and sometimes it is like, yeah, get yourself to bed. <laughs> but that's different than like, oh, every time that my legs ache like this and my brain feels mushy like this, that means I have to sleep. That's an old pattern. And so the invitation will just get really present right now, I think is part of the invitation of learning to stay with and train ourselves more gently. And part of the gift of things like practicing with exhaustion. Um, and I think I said earlier also like, you know, this isn't, this is about our relationships. This is, you know, if we're engaged in activism, if we're engaged in, in organizations that are hard to be part of, if we're in, engaged in anything that is tiring, right? Like, um, I know when I started university a few years ago, I noticed so quickly that even my ability to like read the newsletters from the groups that I liked following just like completely vanished. I would see the emails in my box and it was just a little like, oh my God, I can't even, I don't even have any brain capacity to read even the titles. And so my staying with was like every few months I'd be like, oh, do I have the energy to even read the titles of the newsletters. <laughs> nope. Okay. That's my checking in and staying with. And then as school pressures lightened and I wasn't, you know, doing 13 hour shifts at hospitals. Um, I, I noticed this spontaneous of like, Oh, I, I can read the headlines. <laughs> oh, I actually want to read like, okay. Half. Oh, okay. I have more capacity. So this, like this checking and how is it now? And that deep honesty Right? Like you could, that's never unhelpful. <laughs> and that's another gift of these sort of challenging ways of practice, uh, experiences that you just have to live through, um, which is different than intentionally putting ourselves in harm's way, right? Um, always want to be really clear that these practices are like when we feel inspired <laughs> to explore and stretch ourselves. Yes. If we feel that we're being blamed or shamed or obliged into these things and it starts feeling abusive, like, or it's, it's being interpreted as accept injustice happening in the world and just stay with and try to be equanimous, like, that's not my understanding of the Dharma in the slightest. Um, and so this is where I wanted to bring in the, or I intentionally brought in this title of like empty practicing when we feel exhausted because of course if you know anything about the dharma emptiness is is not a negative thing um especially it's very central in the mahayana tradition not meaning a void or negation um so much as being in the realm of potentiality that everything is possible in emptiness but it hasn't necessarily formed or manifested yet um as a student of Thich Nhat Hanh, as so many beautiful teachings on emptiness and you might have heard uh, this idea of you know if you look deeply in a piece of paper or say in a book <laughs> um it's not just a book it's every sheet of paper contains the trees that were felled it contains the labor of the loggers and the paper mill workers and the people the booksellers and it contains the sunshine that grew the trees and it contains the ants who <laughs> and and the the mycelium network you know like everything in the universe is contained in everything else that is also emptiness so um so emptiness and exhaustion for me go together in the sense that 
there are causes and conditions that bring about the empty, <laughs> the exhaustion, right? And so this exhaustion that I am bearing, that you are bearing, that we are bearing, it's not actually personal. <laughs> it's not permanent. It's not perfectible. And so sometimes the exploration of emptiness and exhaustion is one of like, oh, what are the shared causes and conditions that are manifest, bringing about this particular manifestation of exhaustion that that can just lighten the load of like, why am I carrying this on my own shoulders? And other times a meditation on emptiness can be like, oh, well, what has this exhaustion emptied me of that might actually be really helpful? Because sometimes our exhaustion empties us of the ego <laughs> of trying too hard. I remember one of my dance teachers when he had his own company would um, always train his dancers just a little extra right before they had a big show because if they were had too much energy they would try too hard and the performance wouldn't go very well but if they were like just a little tired they wouldn't add anything extra and those were actually the best performances and sometimes our tiredness can become this gift of like oh yeah all this extra that i was doing i don't have energy for it i'm just going to stick to the essentials opportunity right and i'm not talking about damaging ourselves by forcing through um something extreme but but turning things around and going oh is is there anything that it's i'm, I'm <laughs> lucky <laughs> to be tired out of um that that can actually be a gift that can be an opportunity um and then also the emptiness you know sometimes like i don't have energy to get through this i don't know how i'm going to do it okay, I'm going to call my ancestors and see if their, their energy can help me through because they've gotten through a lot more than I have or spiritual teachers or the earth's energy, you know, that when we really live into and recognize our interdependence, which is another aspect of emptiness, um, the, the, the pressure of like, how am I going to figure out how to get through this can change into, don't know how I'm going to get through this, that's okay. Um, who, whose energy can I borrow? Whose energy can I tap into? Whose capacity to survive that has already survived before me can I tap into and, and share in that? Um, okay, so those are some, some thoughts, some ideas on, on exhaustion, on being with and training ourselves just a little more gently to train just a little more gently and the opportunity of emptiness to to find possibility where we didn't think that there was possibility so uh we can end the recording now if that's okay thank you thank you coral and